Welcome back to Compass, Finding Spirituality in the Everyday. I'm host, Reverend Ryan Dunn. And for this episode of Compass, I sat down with guest John Pavlovitz, a writer, a pastor, and speaker to discuss peacemaking amidst polarization. John shared insights from his new book, which is called Worth Fighting For, and reflected on the importance of empathy, bridge building, and speaking truth in a divisive world. From exploring the essence of heavy metal music, it was kind of at my urging, to the transformative power of grief, John offered a perspective on spirituality that transcends boundaries. So join us, will you, as we discuss the art of finding common ground in a divided world. If you appreciate the value that our show brings to your day, we would be incredibly grateful if you could take a moment just to leave us a rating and or a review. Your feedback not only helps us to improve the show, but it also makes a huge difference in helping more listeners like you to find us. Here's how you can leave a rating and or review. On Apple Podcasts, open the Apple Podcasts app on your phone or computer, search for Compass, Finding Spirituality in the Everyday, and then scroll down to the ratings and reviews section. Tap the stars to rate the podcast. I mean, five is great. <laughs> if you have a moment, then write a few words about what you enjoy about the show in the review section. On Spotify, what you need to do is launch the Spotify app on your mobile device and head to our podcast page. Below the podcast title, you'll see a rating section represented by stars. Tap that to rate us. Although Spotify doesn't yet support written reviews, the stars are much appreciated and they do count. On YouTube, you head over to the YouTube app, you find our channel, which is Compass Podcast, finding spirituality in the everyday. After watching an episode, hit that like button to show your support and leave a comment to tell us and other viewers what you thought. Your comments help increase our visibility on YouTube and they grow our community. And don't forget to subscribe and click the little bell icon so you never miss out on our content. All right, back on topic, peacemaking with John Pavlovitz. I came across John a number of years ago through Twitter, where John affected a persona of saying the tough things that need to be said. At the time, he was a former youth minister who had, I, I believe, just left the professional ministry and was working on finding his way into whatever it was that came next. And since then, he's found his way. He's published several books, including the popular A Bigger Table, and has become recognized as a voice calling for people of faith to represent grace in the world. He's fun to talk with. I had a good time. I think you will too. So let's talk with John Pavlovitz. Hi, and one more note, just a quick acknowledgement here that there was a little bit of an audio issue on my end on my microphone clipping. So as you hear some clipping through the recording, it's not a problem with your equipment. It's on our end. We did our best to filter it out, but some places it's still kind of shown through a little bit. So thanks for bearing with us. Well, John Pavlovitz is a writer, pastor, a speaker, Former heavy metal musician, or, or maybe it's not former. Do you still dabble in the dark arts a little bit? Uh, I, I'll, I'll leave that for later when people have uh, grown to love me a little bit, so they won't reject <laughs> me right out. Gotcha. <laughs> I don't know. It could be an entryway for some. In fact, I, I wanted yes. to I wanted to offer you this. Normally, we start these interviews with the question, "How goes it with your soul?" I wanted to throw a caveat onto yours. Uh, Sure. Can you think of a of a heavy metal song that describes the state of your soul? You know, Crazy Train pops ah. out first. Yeah. I mean, that's that's almost the first thing that's probably really sad and scary. Yeah. Um, you know, I think about that and my my genre was a little bit more um what they would have called hair metal back in the day. So a little kinder, gentler mm. version. So I was more in the, you know, the uh, Bon Jovi uh, Aerosmith place. But um, yeah, so you 2 songs tend to genuinely speak to my um, spiritual condition. And uh, so I'd say uh, still haven't found what I'm looking for mm. is probably always there with me yeah okay a man on a constant journey of realization i get it uh, i feel like a lot yes, of our sir. listeners are probably there as well this is uh kind of the space that we yep. work in on the compass podcast well um we're touching base because 
just this past month, you've released a, a new book called Worth Fighting For. Uh, certainly within the United Methodist space that I come out of, we are engaging in some of the conversations that uh, that you really talk around and allude to with the book. Mm. So it's timely for at least our little slice of the world. It's timely in general uh, as we head towards another election season as well, uh, where certainly the the rhetoric is going to get pretty polarized too. So uh, can you share a little bit about why you felt like this was the time to bring this book out? What led you to, uh, to penning it together for us and, and releasing it? Yeah, you know, I've been traveling the country, Ryan, for about the past decade and speaking to people in churches, in political organizations, at humanist conferences, atheist events, and there is a similar exhaustion running through really all of the stories that I hear because we have been in this place of elevated urgency, I think, for the past eight or nine years, and we've gone through this planetary health crisis, and we have, of course, the political tribalism. And because of that, I think everyone's been carrying far more than their bodies and brains are equipped to. And so I wanted the book just to be a resource for people who are needing, uh, as I say, a hug around the neck or a kick in the behind, whichever on the day that they require. And it's just meant to be an encouragement to empathetic people who are growing tired. Mm. Well, you've given this book to the rest of us, but certainly you've been engaged in this kind of work of both bridge building, but also the prophetic work of speaking truth, which can be contentious. So how yeah. were you able to, um, I don't know, keep the energy up to not just tire out or burn out? I think it's a it's a daily, almost hourly challenge to do this, Ryan. And I think part of it, it's it's living sort of a holistic experience, looking at the totality of your life, your physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and relational health, and making sure that you're attending to all of those as best you can. Uh, you know, I talk a lot about two wounds that we are primarily responsible for, the wounds of the world and the wounds that we sustain attending to those wounds. And I think many people are better at the former than the latter. We're really good at seeing the injustices and the suffering and, and trying to help people, but we often don't see the toll that it's taking on us. So there's kind of this dual trajectory in the book and in the work that I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Has there been an instant lately, an instance lately where you've been particularly re-energized or kind of re-granted a, a sense of hope for um, what, you push for in terms of like people building relationships with one another, especially across some ideological divides? I think the, the hope and the encouragement comes where you realize that regardless of what is happening politically, theologically, what, what regardless of the big systemic ills that we always have, I think two things, we have proximity and agency. And so we're always somewhere and we can always do something. And as elemental as that sounds, I think that helps keep us encouraged if we can remember that. So for me, it's getting out into my local community or getting time with people in local communities around the country and just hearing the stories and seeing what's actually happening all over. And I, I often call myself, rather than a pastor or an author, a collector of stories, mm. a war correspondent, if you will. And and it's in those those stories that people tell me that I realize there's just so much beautiful work happening that might not trend on social media, that might not make the news or be on people's minds every day. But we need to take, you know, to be attentive to those things because that's where the encouragement comes. How do you gather those stories? Do you have specific practices, especially stories from people who maybe don't share all the same ideological or theological views that you do? I, I think that's the challenge um, because there there is a posture of curiosity that I talk about. That's one of the keys to making sure we're navigating differences well. And that posture of curiosity is really easy to have with people that we have natural affinity toward. And, you know, I talk a lot about the fact that we're all compassionate to some degree, but we are often selectively compassionate. And so for me, it's about paying attention to the small kind of openings that I have as I meet people 
in the street or I'm traveling or I'm at a, you know, a grocery store and, and just being open to having kind of that follow-up question or that follow-up statement that can lead us into a conversation with people that we might not meet any other way. Because I think it's in those environments that people don't have their defense postures up. They're not ready to have a battle, which is why it's so difficult to have those conversations on social media mm -hmm. because everyone is prepared for the confrontation. And so there's a disarming that happens when we meet people in sort of normal circumstances and they might be more open to having a conversation. And we also might be um, gentler in our mm. approach to people. So it's really about paying attention. Yeah. Well, you are active on social media and, and certainly not shy about sharing uh, opinions and viewpoints on social media. Yeah. Have you ever found within that space that you are able to engage in some of this? Um, well, cross-cultural isn't the right word, but, uh, you know, cross-perspective. Uh dialogue that you're talking about it happens i think what i tend to um have realized over the last few years doing this work and this this online work predominantly is that i'm often it's not about necessarily the conversation i may be having with another person or that exchange alone it's the the thousands of people who may be looking on at that conversation and so there might be people who are not in um, sort of, they, they may be reachable. They may be part of what I call the humane middle. And so they're, they're looking at that conversation and they're hopefully learning something in that exchange. And so that's where I see it happening. And I also see it happen over time where people will reach out to me and say, hey, I crossed paths with you here seven years ago and we were you know, diametrically opposite and I have slowly come to realize some things or see things differently. And that's the gratifying part of it. I think in this work, really in all our lives, we want to see change happen instantly with yeah. people. And it's really, it's really going to happen incrementally and we may not even be present. And so the best we can do is kind of offer something in the moment that we hope will take root down the line. Okay. Yeah. The, the change, I don't know, especially at the point where we are right now, uh, some of us may be wondering whether the change will ever happen. Right. Um, and you probably go through days like that as well, uh, especially since so much of your work is dedicated dedicated towards kind of creating this change. Are there some personal practices that you employ on a daily basis or just some ways that you kind of re-engage with uh, like the core meaning of your work and identify some of the hope behind what you're doing? I, I think it's really important for all of us to, um, there, what I call the uh, two-step dance of engaging and withdrawing. Mm. And so there, there's the work we do and the confronting of injustices and the speaking out. And then there's the withdrawal, the moving back to the places of silence and solitude and prayer and meditation. And for me, you know, that was always something I saw in the life of Jesus. You know, there's all those stories in the Gospels where they can't find him. And, you know, they're, you know, 2.30 healing Jesus, where are you? And he is in a solitary place praying. And I think it's because then he could recalibrate. And for all of us, we need to pull out of the fray and really check our motives. What am I intending to do today? And is it still uh, aligned with the mission that I feel like I have when I get up in the morning? And because we all have a story that we tell ourselves about who we are, about you know our own goodness and our own efforts to be agents of healing in the world, but then we have to look at the daily existence that we have and is are those aligned? So I think that helps, that engagement and then the withdrawal. And most of us are engaging, engaging, engaging all the time, never pulling back. Mm -hmm. And so that's a huge part. That pause is so critical. Yeah. Do you have some favorite ways of practicing the pause? You know, for me, it's, it's, it's always going to be nature because I think when I can remove a lot of the evidence sadly of of mankind of that tribalism of the the media and the noise when i can pull back and get some quiet then i can really say okay given you know there's a story that i'm seeing on the in the news and some of that story is true but much of it is not so am i how can i right size the bad news and so when i pull out into nature or get some time with people that i love or just simply you know enjoy life whether it's um something that 
you, you know, are really going to your favorite restaurant or listening to music you love or looking at art, it's really can help ground you and sort of um, just recenter you. Yeah. Well, again, we're talking with John Pavlovitz, author of Worth Fighting For, Finding Courage and Compassion When Cruelty is Trending. How has faith really influenced your approach towards uh, facing down cruelty and fostering compassion? Well, you know, Ryan, I think growing up, I grew up in the Catholic Church, and so that there was a God story that I grew up with. There was this story of Jesus and and Jesus' teachings and what that kingdom was supposed to be, supposedly going to look like or should look like here, and started you know, seeing that I, I wasn't seeing that lived out in local faith communities and in the communities that I was part of. And so I drifted from that uh, for a long time and then got pulled back into organized Christianity when I started volunteering for a church. And, and for me, it was once I saw communities actively trying to live out the Sermon on the Mount as best they could, that was for me the path. And so it's always been about filtering everything I see and do through the lens of that sort of compassionate activist heart of Jesus. And um, so while that is central to what I do and the work that I do, I realize that not everyone shares that perspective. So it's finding the commonalities in my faith tradition and other faith traditions and in people who have no religious affiliations at all. What are the, the common things, the elemental stuff? And that's where I try to do much of my work now. Yeah. I really appreciated it when you shared within the book, uh, in a very authentic way, some of the questions that you had about having a Christian identity, whether that was something that uh, you really did choose, or like a lot of us, if you identify as Christian, because you just always had been Christian. Can, can you talk a little bit about that and, and um, how that does shape your perspective? Well, I think we we all have a, a story, uh, faith-based or not, that we inherited from the people who raised us. And we have these lenses that have formed because of the churches we were a part of growing up and the life experiences that we've had. And so we, we don't, don't often stop to realize that the story has been something that we, we grew up into, so we really weren't even aware of it. Mm. And so I think there's something really important and beautiful about trying to step outside of the story that we came from and just ask questions about it, whether or not it's still valid for us or where are our points of connection or where are our points of disagreement and being okay to wrestle with those things and the, the sort of examined life or the examined spirituality I think is critical if you're going to have one you should be continually wrestling with it and which has led me to often saying that i fight with and for my faith tradition simultaneously and mm. uh but i think that's a good place to be i think that's the place all spiritual people should be yeah well and that's kind of the the tradition of the abrahamic faiths right and where so much of yeah. you know the identity of israel is is one who who wrestles with god the um, Islamic tradition yes. is the struggle, right? And even within the Christian tradition, mm -hmm. uh, we don't have that terminology, but even still, like there is a call towards wrestling. There is a call towards questioning and maybe even skepticism yeah, to a degree. I think, yeah. yeah, I think you look at the parables of Jesus and you see him inviting people to sort of enter a, a picture story and just try to realize you know, to place themselves in another life or another human being or, you know, in someone at the side of the road uh, needing help. And so it's it's inherent in all. I think we have built a modern religion on what we believe or don't believe or maybe where we feel certain. You know, certainty is treasured in a lot of churches. And I think doubt, wrestling and questioning are really where the where the growth happens. And so uh, never I'm never afraid because I'm always cognizant of the fact that God is not intimidated by my questions or my vacillation or even my lack of faith on some days. Only people are made insecure by those things. And so we should be okay in the presence of whatever God would be to ask anything. Hmm. Has there been an a interaction recently that just gives you hope to maybe continue this work into the next week and the week beyond? 
Let's see. I, you know, I, I was at a church in Minnesota last week, and I've been working. I've, I've done four visits to this church because they actually went through COVID, had all the difficulties that all communities have had. And then coming out of COVID, they were um, victims of an act, act of arson, and they lost their church, every, all, the whole building, everything. And so they had to decide, well, given all that we've been through, do we even want to carry on? Can we even do this? And so they invited me to sort of reimagine what the church could be like, knowing all the things that they would learned, and now they weren't beholden to a building or to a system. And that's what we've been doing. And so I've had hundreds of stories come out of that of people just saying, we used to do it this way, but it's okay. We're not afraid to try something that is completely different because we know that, you know, God is still in that creative mode and we can still express the love of God. And so that's one of the things that really encouraged me recently. Yeah, <laughs> that's exciting. So, well, we don't need to get into their story. Maybe we'll we'll reflect this back to, to your story. What does church mm. look like for you? Or maybe the ideal church look like for you? That's a great question. You know, I'm fortunate, Ryan, doing this work that I'm I'm invited by, you know, really beautiful communities, whether they're, you know, mainline or they're more progressive. And there's people who are really asking tough questions about how can the church really be relevant? How can it speak into days like this? And what does the church have to do to overcome the sort of rising presence of a malevolent Christianity that they see out there that people see that it's exclusionary. And so I think for me, it's always about the, the church is always going to exist. It may not be in a building for an hour on Sunday, mm -hmm. you know, that, that model has been slowly, you know, um, disappearing from the patterns of life that people have. And then you and, you know, the pandemic comes along and people learned different rhythms of their lives. So I'm never going to be afraid that the church is going to disappear, but it's going to be less obviously visible because you may not have a place to go and a group of people that are going to count how many are there. It's really in the organic expressions of people who are of faith where they live, where they study, where they shop, and, and those relationships that they're building and those sort of alternative communities are where the church, I think, will be moving forward. You know, there are always going to be people who want that traditional experience, but more and more, it's just people who say, I have these values and I want to live them out individually and collectively, and that is how I express, that's how the church is manifested. Yeah, cool. Well, for those who are maybe curious about the Christian faith, but um, have been uncomfortable with the uh, with the traditional, quote unquote, traditional sense of church, and certainly all the the baggage that kind of comes with that when we start talking about uh, things yeah. like patriarchy and um, you know silencing of the abused and that kind of thing, what kind of, of advice course. would you offer to help them explore their spirituality a little bit? Well, first thing I would say is all the misgivings you have and the tensions and the questions are, are things that I have and that many people have, because I think you can't, if you're self-aware and you're aware of what's happening in the world and you're a person of any sort of empathy, you can look and realize the truth that, you know, the American evangelical church, the white church in America has been responsible for so much injustice. The, the question becomes how can I differentiate that from the teachings and the life of Jesus as expressed in the gospel stories? So I just invite people to, to go into one of those, you know, biographies of Jesus and just begin to read what he said and what he did and, and ask questions about where I find truth in that, whether I find where I find something that feels um, like it's, it's, um, an expression of humanity that I can buy into. So it's not about joining a system or signing on to a religion. It's just, do these teachings and these words, do they resonate in me or, or not? And if they do, then to just read a little more. I mean, that for me is uh, the, the conflict, you know, over the last 2000 years, I think there is a huge mission drift with so much of the church. Mm. And so it doesn't even recognize the thing that it began as. So do do your best to kind of find some spots in there and then look for places where people are genuinely trying to express these teachings in a way that is redemptive and life-giving. Mm. Talk to us about the mission drift. <laughs> I'm curious. I've heard that well, in some places, yeah. 
Yeah, mission drift is often associated with organizations where there's a founder and there's a group of people who begin this organization, this business. And over time, as new people come in, maybe they aren't as steeped in the the whys of that organization existing. And so little by little, it begins to lose the heart, the DNA of why it began. And I think the church is a huge victim of that simply because it keeps splintering and there's new denominations and even one faith community community evolves and people leave. So it's continually looking back and saying, why do we exist in the first place? If, if we want to go back and say, what is our reason for being? Uh, and are we still living that out? Do we still even agree with that sentiment? And if we do, how are we going to express that now in this very new environment with all the urgency that there is uh, existing here? Okay. Well, thanks for that. I know that was a little bit off topic, but so to draw us back no worries, on, though, um, you mentioned empathy uh, just a few moments ago, and that's really kind of the, the key point of a lot of what you're calling people towards, just to take a stance of, of empathy mm -hmm. and listening. Have there been some instances recently when you've been surprised by empathy in a way, in the way that you felt uh, a sense of identification with somebody in a surprising way? I, I think, you know, empathy at its best recognizes that we are all sort of under the same pressures. And I think those pressures are grief, fear, and loneliness. I think those three kind of forces are always at play regardless of our political affiliations or religious traditions. And so it's trying to be aware that everyone is sort of under duress. We're all experiencing the collateral damage of being human. And so I find that when I meet someone and their politics and their religion is not disclosed and I meet them in a place of human to human and we find commonalities, that's the place where I, I feel good because I realize the other stuff, as important as it is to us, is not the elemental stuff. The elemental stuff is what do we love? What do we fear? What do we desire for our lives? And so that happens all the time. And it's only then when you say, okay, but now I know what how you vote, or now I know the church that you're part of, and does that begin to pull away you know, people? And so that's the constant battle. Well, to, to wear the hat of our Andrew Carnegie for a moment, you know, winning friends and influencing people. Uh, do you have any tips or tricks or resources for kind of quickly finding mm. that point of commonality? I, I had an art teacher back in um, when I was a graphic design student and I was an art director as my first career. And one day he said to us, he brought us up to look at a still life that we were getting ready to to draw. And he said, the job of the artist is to show people the beauty and the ordinary things that they have lost sight of the beauty of. And so he brought us up real close and he said, take these things and study them and look at how the light hits them and whether they're smooth or rough or cold or warm. And, and then when you've become a student of what you're drawing, then you can find the thing that you want to share in that. Um, and I think we have to become students of other people, mm -hmm. constantly asking questions, constantly in that posture of curiosity and realizing that we always have something more to learn about someone or we always have something that we can learn about how to be a better human. Even from someone we disagree with, there's there's always something there if we're willing to linger long enough uh, to to learn that. Well, John, thank you so much for offering those tips and for bringing your perspective. Sure. Uh, what's next for you? Uh, you know, I'm not quite sure. I always have an idea of what I've learned doing this work over the last 10 years, especially is that I never, I hold my convictions tightly, but the uh, expression of those loosely. Mm -hmm. So I'm doing some writing on grief right now on the universal grieving that we all experience. And so doing some writing on that, I've got an online community where we're having conversations about grief and about politics. And then I'm working on possibly a children's book. And so there's a lot of really exciting things and then we've got this sort of election little stuff going on <laughs> right. in november so so i just try to get up every day and and be useful and and offer my best to what's in front of me and see what happens yeah well if you have a little bit more time tell us about the online community sure. uh what kind of work is going on there yeah, it's called Empathetic People Network. And really, it came out of the fact that, you know, I, I had this experience 
local church pastor, um, ended up getting fired from a community because I was outspoken on issues of race and sexuality, and then had a blog post go viral and had this just influx of attention and opportunity. And so, but what I realized was people were assembling around my writing, religious and non-religious people. They had those commonalities uh, that we've talked about earlier, but I didn't have a way to connect them outside of just reading the writing. And so we created Empathetic People Network as a way, it's a, it's a closed private social media platform where people can join and have these conversations about politics, religion, you know, d uh, depression, grief, and not have to worry about trolls or bots or ads. And it's just great because we've got rooms where we're talking about parenting or we're discussing current events. And it's just a really um, beautiful expression of what, what we talked about earlier. This to me is the church. It's people coming together to share life and it's not a building, but it's definitely true relationship. And uh, so that's what, what's happening there. It's really exciting. Yeah. Uh, do you get a sense that there is a, a connection of people from across some uh, ideological spaces connecting through the, the Empathetic People Network? There, There is. And where I find it happens is in those, those universal you know, struggles. So mm. the grief writing has been a way for me to reach people in a way because that is universal. And when people want to express something, you know, loss is not, it, loss is bipartisan mm. and it, it's, it, it's interfaith. And so that, that is as difficult as grief is, it's, it allows me a doorway into people's lives that I might not have any other way. Cool. Well, and all that stuff can be found through your, your website, which easily enough is johnpavlovitz.com, right? Yeah, if you can spell my name, there aren't a lot of us <laughs> out there, so you'll probably reach me. <laughs> all right, my friend. Thank you for being a part of our Compass Conversation and community. And we look forward to continuing to explore spirituality in the everyday alongside you. You might want to listen to another episode of Compass. <laughs> I highly recommend it. And if you like this episode, then I recommend episode number 130, that's called Faith Vacations and Lostness with Debbie Thomas. Or another good episode would be number 123, that's called Nice Church, Not Nice Patriarchy. That's with Liz Coolis Jenkins. There's plenty in that episode about gracefully speaking truth to corrupt systems of power. And again, while you're listening, leave a rating and or review. The Compass Podcast is brought to you by United Methodist Communications. And that's all for this week. We're going to be back again with a new episode in two weeks time. So I will chat at you then. Peace.